This video will deal with springs and simple harmonic motion. This is a little bit of a prelude to the study of waves uh, that will not be covered in this video. Um, so, just by way of illustration, there are waves here. The guitar is creating sound. There are waves on the string. Uh, there are waves in the water that are here. Um, there's light waves from the light that's coming from the, the setting sun. So, uh, waves are important. Okay, getting to oscillations. Right? Oscillations. So, a piece of metal here or a ruler, and we have it uh, vertical at its equilibrium position, but someone has uh, pulled it to one side, and then the artwork shows the, uh, the ruler uh, going back and forth, oscillating, after the uh, force over here has been released. The molecules in here are uh, under tension and apply force that will bring the ruler back to here but it has momentum and passes through the equilibrium position over to the other side and then the other side of the ruler uh, is uh, extended and one side compressed so it creates a force going back eventually friction takes energy away from the system and it comes to rest uh, vertical again but there is oscillation uh, present here back and forth motion oh, more details on the spring here a particular spring is hanging vertically and various masses are attached to the end of the spring. Mg would create the weight. So we have a uh, uh, Mg calculation here and we find a certain stretch for the spring as uh, we take measurements. And what is observed is that when we make a graph of the, uh, the data here we get a straight line the force being plotted vertically and the displacement horizontally uh, the force is the mg we find a straight line and we have a slope to this line and that slope is denoted with a k we're looking here at Hooke's law at Hooke's law and the spring is uh, supporting the mass here uh, the mass is not moving up or down so it's stationary here so the force of the spring on the mass is equal to the weight that it's supporting and we find that the force of a spring is equal to a negative times this force constant K multiplied by X the stretch of the spring or compression of a spring if you have one that uh, allows compression but F equals minus KX Hooke's law being illustrated this graph will explain the minus sign now I could do it right now if X is downward, if X is the positive in the down direction, the force of the spring is upward. The force of the spring is upward. So the X uh, displacement has opposite direction of the force of the spring. So if X is downward, force of the spring is upward. That's where the minus sign comes from, and F equals minus KX. So F equals minus KX, force in newtons. The force constant will have units of newtons per meter and X will be the meters. Um, this force is a restoring force. If we pull a spring away from its equilibrium position and then let it go, the force tries to restore the spring back to the equilibrium position. So it's a restoring force. The minus sign clues us in on that. If X is positive, the force of the spring on the end of the spring is going to be in the negative direction. Springs have a potential energy the, the spring force is a conservative force. It has a potential energy and we calculate its value with one half K X squared. Very important that you square the X here uh, for a couple of reasons. If we extend a spring then we put energy into the system. We're going to do work on it to pull the end of the spring away from equilibrium and the spring is going to obtain some positive potential energy so that X value squared, well, that's going to make a positive. If X is positive, but what if we compress the spring? If the X value is negative, the spring still is going to contain energy and a positive energy. So we need the square to create that positive sign. And then the square gives us the correct value of the potential energy. Um, so if we are on a horizontal surface or a vertical surface, uh, we can set up an equation to conserve energy. Um, and the energy as the spring oscillates back and forth will change from potential to kinetic in our standard calculation for kinetic energy one half mv squared. 
Now, as we seek to work problems here in this chapter with springs, something you should be careful of. Uh, is this force a constant as x changes? As the spring oscillates back and forth, is the force constant? You should say no, because the x number is changing. How far the end of the spring is away from the equilibrium position is changing. Though the force changes, f equals ma can still be applied here. The acceleration changes. So you must not use the four kinematic equations where uh, the acceleration needs to be a constant. So velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by time. That's the first of the four kinematic equations. Uh, you cannot use those here because the acceleration is not constant. So we'll use energy methods, energy methods, kinetic and potential energy, to solve problems involving, uh, involving springs. Um, as the spring goes back and forth, it has a period and has a frequency. It has a period and has a frequency. So looking here at the spring that's been stretched out from the equilibrium position, x equals zero at the equilibrium position. It's been stretched out and then released. As it's released, it moves back and forth. When it crosses the equilibrium position, the force is zero, but it doesn't stop here because of the momentum of the object um, and the energy of the object, for that matter. One half mv squared here, kinetic energy. So the spring gets compressed. The energy goes into potential form. The force of the spring is off to the right on the mass. It goes back out to uh, this full amplitude. Uh, the maximum x value is the amplitude. And it goes back and forth. The time to go back and forth is the period. That'll be in seconds. And notice it uses the symbol capital T. It's not temperature now in this chapter. It means the period of the oscillation. The period of the oscillation. And what would happen if the spring could exert more force? If we pull a certain number of uh, meters off to the side here, 0.3 meters or something, and we put in a spring, and we're doing this with a spring that has a larger force constant, a stiffer spring, will this spring be able to pull the mass faster? And the answer is yes. So the uh, stiffness of the spring will make a difference on the period. will get us to this side faster and then a stiff spring here being compressed will get the mass back to the right side faster. So with a stiffer spring we'll have a, a smaller period. We have more force available. What if we would change the mass of the object? If the mass would become greater is that going to affect the time to go back and forth? And the answer is yes, because now with a certain given force, if we make the mass larger, the acceleration will be smaller. A more massive object is harder to accelerate. The acceleration will be smaller, and it'll take more time to get to this compressed position, and then this force um, accelerating this larger mass, it'll take more time to get to the uh, full amplitude off to the right. So there are two effects on the period. Uh, the mass and the force constant. We'll get to an equation of those in a little bit later. But here's a, uh, uh, just an illustration here of what the position is doing, what the velocity is doing, what the acceleration is uh, looking like for the uh, uh, object that's on the spring. So notice when is the uh, acceleration at its maximum, at its largest value, either positive or negative. Well, it's when we have the full amplitude for x. And when is the velocity zero? That's when we're at the full amplitude, when the object is uh, just at that instant done going down and it's about to, about to go back up, or done going up and about to come back down. The velocity in that situation is uh, zero when we're at the full amplitude, either uh, compressed or extended for the spring. Um, these graphs, you may realize, are trig functions, uh, sine and cosine, uh, with some offsets to them, and we'll, we'll cover that in a, uh, a future time. So, simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion. If the acceleration is proportional to the displacement, the motion is called simple harmonic motion. The acceleration needs to be proportional to the displacement. And for a spring, that is true. F equals minus kx. 
So the force is proportional to displacement. F equals MA. In these spring problems, mass is a constant. So the force is proportional to X. That means the acceleration is proportional to X. We have simple harmonic motion, and there's some special equations that can apply when we have a simple harmonic motion situation. We've already talked about the period, one complete oscillation. Frequency is not too difficult to calculate. It's just one divided by the period. And the frequency units are hertz. After Professor Hertz, who worked with uh, waves in the 1800s, and we use a lowercase f for the frequency. The frequency is 1 divided by the period number. And if you want to work it the other way, that's fine. Uh, period is 1 divided by frequency. You can cross multiply these. Uh, period is 1 divided by frequency, or frequency is 1 divided by period. In the case of simple harmonic motion, the period is simply calculated with 2 times pi times the square root of mass divided by force constant. Mass in kilograms, force constant in newtons per meter. Mass in kilograms, uh, force constant in newtons per meter. So 2 pi times the square root of m over k. Just make sure you have standard units here. If you want to get seconds for the time, you must have mass in kilograms, the force constant, and newtons divided by meters. And there is a link between simple harmonic motion and waves um, with the uh, displacement uh, being calculated with the uh, cosine function, the velocity being calculated with the sine function, and the acceleration being calculated with the cosine function. Uh, so I'm not going to go over those in this video. Um, just realize there is a, a strong connection between simple harmonic motion and waves, and the uh, analysis of the two can be somewhat interchanged. So, you ought to be writing down some uh, questions and uh, asking your instructor, uh, trying to verify what uh, happens when mass increases. Make sure you're comfortable with that. As the mass gets bigger, we have a, uh, a larger period. If the force constant is larger, a stiffer spring, then the period gets smaller. These are controlled by a square root. It's not directly proportional. There's a square root involved in the situation. The potential energy of the spring, one-half kx squared. Uh, displacement is how far we are from equilibrium. That's the x value. Amplitude is the maximum displacement. Um, we can calculate the period 2 pi times square root of the mass in kilograms divided by the force constant. Uh, maybe I should go back here just to this uh, relationship. What would happen if I would uh, have a larger amplitude to the motion? Does that affect the period? Uh, where in here do you see amplitude as a variable? And the answer is you do not. The period does not depend on the amplitude. As long as we stay in simple harmonic motion, uh, we have the case that the period does not depend on the amplitude. We can pull the spring to the right just a little bit, let it go, and we get a certain period. We pull the same spring and the same mass off to the right, double the distance, and we'll still have simple harmonic motion. Uh, we'll have the same period. Amplitude does not affect the period of the motion. Amplitude does not affect the period of the motion. And then perhaps just uh, I'll tie in a little bit with Archimedes' principle and buoyant force. Suppose we had a piece of wood floating on water, calm water, no waves, and we drop a rock or a piece of clay or a piece of mud onto that wood and that material stays on the wood the collision is going to cause the wood to sink into the water a little bit and it's going to overshoot uh, the balance point between buoyant force and depth in the water for the wood it's going to be there's going to be some momentum the wood's going to go further down and then the buoyant force is going to push the wood back up and that's going to go too far and then the wood's going to go come back down gravity's going to pull the system back down and uh, the wood's going to go past the equilibrium position again this is a case of simple harmonic motion for, for a small amplitude here. This will be simple harmonic motion. There is a restoring force present. The buoyant force is seeking to restore. As this wood on the first uh, sinking into the water, as the wood goes too deep, the buoyant force is seeking to push the wood back up uh, so it's not quite so deep in the water. And as this uh, continues on upward, 
then when we get uh, to the place where the buoyant force is weaker than the uh, gravity, the weight due to gravity, then the weight is going to bring the system back towards the equilibrium position. So we're going to have oscillating motion. And it's going to be simple or harmonic because the buoyant force is proportional to the depth, to the displacement in the water. Our wood has a certain cross-sectional area. As we go deeper, we displace more water, and that uh, is proportional to the buoyant force. So this will be a case of simple harmonic motion. There is, there is a restoring force present, and that restoring force is proportional to the depth of the wood in the water. That's the displacement in this uh, situation, somewhat similar to a spring. And I'm sure you can think of other examples. You should do so and check with your instructor to see if they, you think there's simple harmonic motion.